ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the beautiful headquarters of the Lowy Institute here at 31 Bly Street. I'm Michael Fullilove. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. We're really delighted today to host this la the launch of this book, The Consul, an insider account from Australia's diplomatic frontline by Ian Kemish, um, a non-resident fellow at the Institute. This is a really valuable and timely new book published by the University of Queensland Press. The issue of consular assistance for Australians is perennial and important. It's um, evocative, it's emotive. I know we have Kate Logan, the head of consular for DFAT with us and some of her team who do incredible work um, on behalf of Australians. And I've heard, um, I've heard many uh, diplomats from other countries uh, from time to time compliment me on the work that DFAT does. I know that the, the service that DFAT provides to Australians, especially in difficulty, is really peerless. And there's a lot of stories of that in this book. It really gets into the, the human element of the issue as well as the, the thematic issues. Ian Kemish is one of our finest diplomats. In a career spanning 25 years, he served as High Commissioner to PNG, Ambassador to Germany, he headed Australia's consular service, and he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for his leadership of Australia's response to the 2002 Bali bombings. So for that reason, we're delighted to be hosting this book. It's an important book, and it's by someone that we regard very highly. Now, let me tell you how this evening will work. Shortly, I'll call on the Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable Tim Watts, MP, to formally launch the Consul. After Tim speaks, Ian will respond briefly, and then my brilliant colleague, Natasha Kassam, author of the 2022 Lowy Institute poll, among many other um, excellent products, will come up on stage to chair a discussion between Ian and Tim. So, my, the only last remaining thing I have to do is to introduce Tim Watts, and that's a great pleasure for me to do so because I've admired him um, from a distance for, for some time. Um, Tim is the Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs. Before entering Parliament as the member for Jellybrand in 2013, he worked in the tech sector and as a political staffer. He served in a number of roles in the Parliament, including as the Shadow Assistant Minister for Cyber Security and Communications. Um, but apart from all that, he's just a very thoughtful person and he's somebody who has published two books, the first, Two Futures, which was written by the now Home Affairs Minister, Claire O'Neill, looking at long-term options for Australia. The second book, Golden Country, as he just said to me, uh, on Australia's immigration policy, published just before Australia's immigration closed down um, for, for Fortress Australia. So maybe the timing for that um, book launch wasn't ideal, but the timing for this one, Assistant Minister, is. So it's really great to see people, if I can, if I can say that, of, of Tim's quality and thoughtfulness in public life, and now uh, occupying an executive position is something I'm very happy to see. So Tim, thank you for accepting our invitation, and thank you. Let me call on you to formally launch the Consul by Ian Kemish. Tim Watts. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for that, uh, that very generous uh, introduction. I really should bring you everywhere I go. <laughs> um, and uh, congratulations, Ian, as a fellow author. I, I have some uh, sympathy for the, the, how much you pour into the process of, of writing a book. So congratulations on getting here to launch the book. You got the photo? Always be selling. <laughs> this is your new job. Um, so good evening, everyone, Ian, Michael, Natasha. Um, I would like to start my uh, remarks by acknowledging the traditional land. It's the land in which we meet the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders uh, past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people here with us this evening and commit myself, as all members of the new Albanese government, to the full implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, Voice, Treaty and Truth. It really is a great pleasure to be here today at the Lowy Institute to launch Ian's wonderful new book, The Consul, an insider account from Australia's diplomatic frontline. I mean, it is appropriate that we have Kate Logan, um, a, a subsequent generation of, of consular um, a, a, a service as the first assistant secretary, consular and crisis management division with us here today. Thanks for coming, Kate. Ian's book provides us with a wonderful personal perspective 
into the world of consular work and its evolution through the really significant trends that have shaped um, at the last uh, decades, the rise of terrorism, the emergence of cheap air travel um, and the internet. It's a compelling read. Uh, it takes us to all the corners of the world and shows us leadership in times of crisis, empathy in the face of tragedy, and celebrates the highest ideals of public service. Most of all, though, Ian's book left me feeling deeply proud to be Australian. It's a sentiment that I know many in consular service share. Ian, you wrote about your friend and colleague, Roger, who died in a light plane crash in Vanuatu and the kindness that consular officials showed to Roger, Roger's family and yourself. And you included a reflection Roger left you on a rainy Canberra morning outside the DFAT offices in your book. And as Roger turned to you and said with a hint of irony about your job, quote, isn't it a great feeling knowing we're doing this for Australia? I'm pleased that Roger's former wife, Chrissy was here to join us this evening. In this book, time and time again, the Australian spirit shines through. When people are at their lowest, in loss and grief and terror, we see Australians standing in solidarity with their compatriots. Following the 2002 Bali bombing, Ian tells the story of expat Australians unprompted turning up to help, volunteering to phone hospitals and hotels to search for the missing and the injured demonstrating that Australian instinct to get stuck in and to help, an instinct that DFAT's consular division has professionalised through training and expertise. Dean also, Ian also tells us about Lyle Crawford at the Australian Embassy in Kathmandu, who was responsible for the rescue of an Australian climbing party in the Himalayas. The operation was part diplomacy, liaising with Chinese officials to allow a Nepalese military helicopter to enter Chinese airspace for a mountainside rescue in a full business suit as well. But it was mostly about courage. Having completed the dangerous rescue operation of the climbing party, Lyle agreed to go back into the mountain a second day in extraordinary circumstances to recover the body of a deceased Australian, all in the name of bringing an Australian home. This demonstration of the Australian spirit continues beyond the conclusion of, Australia's, of, of Ian's book in the consular service today. Diana Shi was part of the crisis team dispatched to Poland to help Australians who are caught up in Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine. And following the tragic death of Michael O'Neill, and with large parts of the country under siege, Diana and her team went to extraordinarily, extraordinary lengths, working with Ukrainian military officials and local funeral directors to recover his remains from the front lines and to get them back from Poland to Poland. Diana then flew the remains back to Michael's family in the close-knit community of Geveston in Tasmania, less than 24 hours before his memorial services. Now, the actions taken by Lyle, Diana and those Australian volunteers in Bali in 2002, they're not described in any DFAT policy document or procedure manual. They were people doing things because it was the right thing to do. And Ian quotes the former DFAT secretary, Francis Adamson, in the book, um, it was put to Adamson that DFAT officers were people who were willing to get things done. And Adamson replied, quote, that's not necessarily because we're diplomats. It probably has to do with the fact that we're Australians. And this is why the Albanese government will continue to resource and support our consular services and extend a helping hand to our nationals overseas because it's the Australian thing to do. It's the right thing to do and it's what Australians expect us to do. But in 2022, the task of delivering high quality consular services is significantly more challenging than in previous years. The most pressing of these challenges has been COVID-19 and its impact on the way that we travel. And while I remain critical of decisions made by the former government that caused so many Australians to be left stranded in precarious circumstances in recent years, I would like to take a moment to recognise all of the DFAT staff who served overseas during the pandemic and during these border closures that we sustained our overseas presence and that many of you went for extraordinary lengths of time without seeing your families or coming home is a testament to your resilience and commitment to service. In many parts of the world with borders closed, consular officers once again took on a far larger role than what their policy and procedures indicated that they should be doing, what their day job was. 
Now, I have some sympathy for this, as all, I think, members of parliament um, do during this time, because our electorate offices became front desks for pastoral support in our communities, um, as was the case in many of these overseas missions, trying to help Australians to get home. Now, today, with borders open and travel resuming, Australians are finding themselves subject to changing testing and isolation requirements, as well as unexpected costs from additional hotel stays and delayed travel arrangements. Travellers are discovering that their insurance may not cover them for specific COVID-19 related expenses. And a travel industry, which is struggling to awaken from its COVID hibernation, is leading to delays, lost baggage and cancellations. As someone that travels quite a bit for their day job, it's not much fun travelling at the moment sometimes. Now, our advice to travellers travelling internationally is to research entry, exit and testing requirements and providers before you travel. Be prepared that if you test positive for COVID-19, you may be required to quarantine at your own expense, causing sometimes expensive delays and disruption to your plans. And read the fine print on your travel insurance. Check you're covered for COVID-19 related expenses before you leave. Now, a second challenge for the growing number of con is the growing number of consular cases involving serious mental health episodes that we are currently seeing. The mental health epidemic that we're currently seeing in Australia, in part due to the stress and isolation and disruption of the pandemic, is also playing out for Australians beyond our borders. And that's why our consular officers are properly trained to understand and respond to these cases. But we do need to identify further supports for those overseas. And when people do return home, we need to ensure that those supports are in place for them when they return. In this respect, our advice to Australians travelling is to be aware of the potential triggers for mental health conditions, including separation from family and friends and changes to your normal routines. Get enough prescription medication to keep you in good health for the duration of your stay while you're away. And check those medications are legal in the country you're travelling to. And be aware that attitudes and beliefs about physical illness and mental health can vary greatly in other countries and mental health conditions aren't as always accepted as in, as in the way they are in Australia. Now, a third challenge that it is ensuring that our consular service is ready to respond and to support the diversity that is modern Australia. Um, in his book, Ian jokes that uh, if a plane went down between Tashkent and Vladivostok, there would have almost certainly been an Australian on board. And he's right. And in decades past, that Australian might have been a wily mining executive or an intrepid backpacker. But today, they're just as likely to be someone on a regular family reunion. The face of Australia has changed. We are more diverse and we're more likely to live complex cross-border lives. And our consular services need to understand and to reflect this. We should consider how to better support the families of Australian citizens, including permanent residents and other visa holders, as well as dual nationals, when they are in their country of other nationality. Our assistance to these groups, particularly in a crisis, reflects modern Australia and the values of modern Australia. Now, Ian's book is in many ways a story of innovation, the invention of the smart traveller and the pop-up airport kiosks to print off the smart traveller advice and responding to a changed travel environment following September 11. He observes that it's not enough for travel advice to be accurate and timely, that it has to reach its intended audience. Now, the challenges we face in delivering consular services today mean that we have to continue innovating in the context of these changed circumstances. DFAT needs to think carefully about how they deliver services to new cohorts with new challenges, with the same compassion and commitment that shines through in Ian's book. I'm looking forward to working with Foreign Minister Wong and with DFAT for getting this right. Because how we help people in their time of need is an expression of all of us as a nation. And before I conclude, I just have to tell one anecdote from the book that I think reflects the Australian spirit in a different way than the, the serious gravitas that we've been talking about today. And this is an anecdote uh, from the book from Ian's time as ambassador to Germany. Now, Ian made a point in the when he was ambassador to travel to Munich to meet with a local police chief in the wake of Oktoberfest to express his appreciation for their support in looking after the growing Australian contingent that attended the event. Now, the police chief reassured him that Australians were not his biggest problem, but Ian does admit to visiting Munich each October for the rest of his posting, just in case. <laughs> 
And this regard, Ian, shows a distinctly Australian approach to the provision of consular care, and I salute your commitment. Thank you again for help of inviting me to launch this delightful book, Ian. Um, I wish you all the best um, in its uh, sales now that it's in, in the market. And I commend the book to all of you in the audience. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs>
that uh, many Australian diplomats and consuls have. Um, Melissa's husband, Scott, was killed in the 2002 Bali bombings. Um, I met Melissa and her daughter, Madeline, at the first anniversary, and we became friends. Uh, it's the 20th anniversary soon. The backing track to this story uh, is the sweep of global history since the fall of the Berlin Wall. The beginning of a loop in history that seems to be completing itself or reaching some kind of point of culmination in Eastern Europe right now. The growing but muffled drumbeat of international terrorism through the 90s and the extraordinary turning point that was September 11, an event that ushered in the war on terror, the Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts that changed our collective mindset in ways that we're only still now coming to understand, I think, um, that changed the way we travel and that led to substantial changes for the, the, the consular service. Along the way, I've reflected on where things went wrong, where they went right, um, on the intersection between the world of politics and media and the consular service. Um, I've talked a bit about the unwritten contract between the Australian travelling public and the Australian government uh, as to what services we should be providing Australians abroad um, and how Australians' expectations have grown uh, in keeping with the ever-increasing pace of communications and the advent of social media as an instant public form of feedback. I've discussed the risk that consular, risk, that, that consular work may actually now be looming too large in the profile uh, uh, and understanding of the role of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I've also thought a bit about what the Consular Service tells us about Australia and its role in the immediate region. I think the Bali response was a seminal moment in that sense, a response that involved Australia establishing a full-scale Australian emergency response on the sovereign territory of another country. In the end, as you said, uh, it's a story about Australians. And when I think of the best attributes of our often earthy, pragmatic and yet creative consular officers, they're Australian attributes. And I think we can be pretty proud of that. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, and to the Assistant Minister for those insightful comments. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Natasha Kassam. I direct the Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program here at the Lowy Institute. Now, I'm going to ask Ian some questions and then I'll come to you in the audience So, and my colleagues will bring mics around. Some of you will know that I started my career at DFAT and when Ian writes about the way resources are pulled in for these crises, I was immediately pulled to my very first year when I was one of those graduate trainees that was reined into the 24-7 crisis centre to man the phones as we launched the evacuation of many, many Australians out of Egypt during the Arab Spring. I was always amazed from that moment at the kind of scale of the department's effort and the gratitude that we received, I think, from the people we spoke to on the phone, but also, of course, the, the very small minority of people who you know, ask questions like, well, will I be getting frequent flyer points for this particular trip? <laughs> it is a small minority, as you make clear, Ian. So I want to start in this question about, you know, you touch on the book, how you assume joining the department you're going to be globe-trotting, negotiating multilateral treaties, representing at the United Nations. At the other end, you write a book about consular mm. services, you know, what many perceive to be the most boring or the most, most mundane. Of course, that's not the case in this book, but that's what stands out to you. It's one of the Twin Peaks. How does that feel? Yeah, consular work took me by surprise. Um, it was not at all what I was thinking about when I joined Foreign Affairs and Trade, as you say. You're sort of taken up with all sorts of ideas about the role you might have, and actually, I did quite a bit of that stuff, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the being in the room at the White House and, and um, uh, being involved in, in treaty making and all the rest of it. Um, but much of the work took me by surprise. I don't have any real memory of uh, anyone talking to me about consular work in my graduate training year. Probably they did, and I didn't pay any attention. Um, I certainly, I'm not even sure I understood what consular work was when I joined DFAT. Um, but I learnt it over time, as I recount in the book. And as I've said, and you just said, it was a formative period in my life, in our lives, 
because there is a rawness and a reality about it. I think it is when you're at DFAT and you're doing foreign policy, so much of it feels big picture. And then, as you say, consular becomes the thing where you're really in touch with the Australian people. Now, one of the things you write about, I think, really beautifully is how in different consular cases, particularly when it comes to arbitrary detention, there are different reactions to how people feel the government has done. You know, some people feel the government hasn't done enough. In other cases, they're very, very grateful. One of the points or the themes that I really pay attention to was the level to which making these cases public have an impact on the outcome. And some feel that DFAT keeps it quiet for those private negotiations. Some feel that having a lot of public attention is helpful. You know, how do you feel about weighing up those cases? I know it's really difficult, but where do you think you land? It is difficult, and, and my thinking about this has evolved a bit. I, I was involved in uh, a case which has largely been forgotten um, uh, back in the year 2001 involving uh, an Australian couple who were imprisoned in Laos. It became quite a sort of political, political bugbear, frankly, for the foreign minister uh, at, at, the, at the time. I think you probably remember that, Brad. The, the, um, <laughs> uh, and the, um, uh, it became a real cause celeb publicly. Um, my view then, and I th think it remains my view about that particular case, was that the media that the family pushed and, and, and drummed up set us back, um, caused the Lao authorities to um, uh, become a bit more entrenched in their, pos in their, in their position um, and probably added several months to the, ex the very difficult experience for the, the couple concerned. I certainly thought that at the time. Um, there have been more recent cases. Peter Grester is a great example where a public campaign conducted in a clever way, in a very broad-based way, um, with a, a kind of strategic understanding, I think, between the government on one hand and the family on the other, was very effective in bringing off an outcome. Um, the case that we, you're probably thinking about, and others, others are thinking about, are, is the case of someone who's also become a friend like uh, Peter Grester, and that's Kylie Moore Gilbert, who, um, you know, I don't want to speak for Kylie, but I've, I've, I've talked to her quite a bit about this, and I, her, her view is basically that um, she's very grateful to, to the Australian government for the outcome that was, was achieved. She um, has developed great respect for some of the individuals who, who worked with her, including particularly Lyndall Sachs, who was the ambassador in Tehran for most of that time. Um, but she takes issue quite quite strongly with the decision, um, with the push of the Australian government to, to go for quiet diplomacy, to try to convince her family to stay away from the media. She takes the view that every time her case bubbled up in the media, her treatment in jail improved. Um, so she draws a straight line. I just think that... Um, d I, I suspect Kate agrees, but I'm not going to speak for her, but I, I think it's horses for courses, and I think that um, there needs to be an understanding um, and a cleverly um, designed public strategy where you're working as a team with family. That can work. I think, you know, that's an interesting case where Kylie says, you know, she thinks sunlight was the best disinfectant. As mm -hmm. you say, there are other cases where maybe the outcome hasn't been... Um, well, it hasn't worked out, perhaps, in the way that people wanted it to. One of the Chappelle other... Corby is a, is a great example of that, right. by the way. So, and, I mean, so one of the issues, I think, in the past and that you write about quite a lot is that question of negotiating with kidnappers and paying ransoms and how the government was never willing to do that because of incentivising bad behaviour. I want to turn that on its head and ask you about hostage diplomacy and whether negotiating with states when they've taken hostages is kind of doing the same thing. And of course, I ask this when we have several Australians held on trumped up charges. We have Yang Hengjun, Cheng Lei that you write about in China, Sean Tennell, who's a friend of the Institute in Myanmar. How do you feel about the need to kind of negotiate with states or perhaps bend to coercion on some level for those citizens? This is really tough stuff. And, and it's... Um and there are some fundamental issues to, to, to wrestle with, with here. Um, 
again, Kylie's case involved a prisoner swap. Yeah. We've never done that before. Um, th that, that was quite an extraordinary thing uh, to, to have done. The, um, I, I think in these cases we really do need to call it out, uh, describe as it, it is what it is, what's happening. You know, the, in, in dealing with the situation in China, it's obviously complicated by the, the state of the bilateral relationship. Indeed, I strongly suspect that these cases exist uh, in reflection of the state of the bilateral relationship um, to some considerable extent. So very, very hard to, to work with. I think we have to do what we do, which is to be insistent, uh, um, including publicly, on release. Um, but our strategy needs to be guided by the particular circumstances of the case. And with these current cases, I, I don't know the details. I, I can't know the, um, the circumstances and what we're dealing with. There are people in the room who do. <laughs> but I, um, uh, so, but I, I, and I have some sense of confidence that these issues are being worked on pretty well. Well, maybe a slightly less hard question from me. You know, you talk about that confidence. You also write about how, you know, in one sense, the service will always be comparing itself to other countries, that we consider ourselves like-minded. You use that example after September 11, how we flew families out to New York because the United Kingdom had decided to do that. But on balance, how do you think Australia stacks up when you look around the world at what others are doing? For their citizens. Oh, I, I think we're the top of the Premier League right now. Um, it's we haven't always been. Um, we uh, when I first inherited the Australian Consular Service, I think the Canadians were the leaders of the pack uh, in terms of the, their level of sophistication, the, t the technology, um, uh, their their responsiveness, um, and we had a look at them and thought, yeah, that's where we want to that's where we want to go, and we caught up and surpassed them, I think, for, for quite a while. I think right now we're, we're at the top of the tree. Um, it's an interesting place to be because it also means that you're meeting expectations um, uh, uh, at a high and consistent level and there's a question whether you really want to be there. there there's, 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 this is an ever, it's a never ending debate. Um, but I think much better to be there than elsewhere. I think. A lot of people would agree with you. I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to come to the audience. If you want to put up your hand, um, one of my colleagues will bring a microphone around. You know, Tim mentioned this as well and this is becoming increasingly something that Australia has to do better at as such a multicultural society. You know, I think more than 250 ancestries here, half the country was born overseas or has a parent born overseas. So how is that kind of posing a greater challenge when we think about the dual nationalities we think about? how interconnected people's lives are? I think um, when we talk about and think about consular clients, Australians in need overseas, I think even now for many Australians, that person that they imagine has a white face uh, as an Anglo-Saxon um, Australian. Um, that is not the case. And it actually hasn't, hasn't been the case for a long time. Uh, we had a, a particular moment, didn't we, during the, the, the COVID era where um, uh, effectively a, um, a group of Australians, Indian Australians um, uh, in India, were told that they could not return to the country. Uh, didn't last long. Um, and there was quite a public outcry about, about it and the former government sort of managed it away. That was quite a moment because there, there are very few rights in all of this. People are surprised. Australians actually have absolutely no legal right to consular service. There's no right at all. It's, it's simply a matter of policy, uh, a matter of what we expect our government should do. But there is one right. It's an international right, and it's the right of abode. And it um, looked to me like we breached that for a little while there. Um, for a group of Australians. And we had one, I didn't put it in the book, but I'll say it now, we had one former minister um, talk about uh, how the people concerned were all Indians. They're all Australians. And this, this, this is a point that I think is progressively being understood. 
Um, there was a lot of uh, lot, lot, lot of not very um, attractive discussion around the time of the 2006 uh, evacuation of Australians from Lebanon because many of them were joint joint nationals, dual nationals. Um, they were Australians, and you're either Australian or you're not. And the face of this country is changing. I mean, that particular decision, you know, as an Indian Australian, I definitely felt that mm. uh, quite personally. So I think it's yeah, good to recognise that those kinds of decisions, I think, are further away from what modern Australia looks like. Um, if there are any questions, please put up your hand and if you could identify yourself um, and my colleague will bring you a microphone. We have one down here. Thank you. Johanna Pittman, I'm the CEO of Advance Global Australians. So we represent overseas expatriates, Australians living overseas. And the average length of time that our members are overseas is probably around 15 years. So they're not your short-term traveller. Mm -hmm. And I think the Assistant Minister captured it well by saying that the government policies <coughs> may have been seen in one regard during the pandemic, but the consular services were, uh, you know, there was a lot of commitment from each of the overseas posts to assist Australians during that time. I think the sense, though, from our membership is that they've never been more disappointed in their treatment and they don't differentiate between government policy and the consular services. They're all wrapped up in yep. one. When you talk about being at the top of the Premier League um, in consular services, how can we regain that perception amongst particularly those high-achieving Australians overseas who have been over there, who are operating at the highest levels? How can we regain that sense of pride and also connection to Australia uh, after the pandemic and how can we build that back again? Yeah, uh, thanks, for, thanks for distinguishing so clearly between government policy and the, and the work of the, the consular service because I really do think that the consular service was the meat in the sandwich uh, in, in those circumstances. In the end, uh, it was an, a, an extraordinary situation. It saw massive displacement of the Australian uh, um, population overseas. In the end, I think it was about somewhere between 600,000 and a million Australians who returned to the, who returned to the country over that period. Uh, and um, many thousands of them were brought home by DFAT. Um, the, uh, it, it, it was a great reflection of global events and that um, uh, the government made the decision it did. The government for once decided to distinguish between the interests of Australians at home and the, and the interests of Australians abroad. How do we regain the trust? Oh, gee, that's an interesting question. I, um, I, I, I think in the end that there probably does need to be a bit of a discussion about this uh, abroad with our, with our Australians overseas and that our embassies do need to be talking about it a bit. And there needs to be a bit of a reflection on what happened and why. Um, and a bit of a reflection on what went right during that period, because a lot more went right than the public narrative might suggest. I think we've got another one here. <coughs> Thank you for your presentation. I'm Kia Masahiko. I'm Consul General of Japan in Sydney. I've been here for two years and a half during COVID time. I really understand the importance of our consular work here. Uh, yeah. So my question is uh, how uh, about the uh, knowledge management or experience management of consular service, because uh, uh, the understand this the plenty of experiences which are so the, the the consular officers and the consulate generals have experienced uh, plenty of uh, events and incidents, <coughs> but the challenge is how to how to make most of such experiences to pass them on to the the future generations or inside the organizations, which are a big challenge. Despite the digitization, those uh, individual experiences are very precious. Maybe training might do, but uh, it's quite limited. So from your experience and having written the book, uh, and that itself is a very great contribution to that, the passing the experience to the next generation. Um, uh, what are the 
Um, any, do you have any suggestions? Or what, what is your experience of, uh, uh, of Australian, uh, um, let's say, DFAT, of uh, somehow uh, making full use of your experience and pass your experience to the inside the organization or to the next generation? Mm -hmm. I understand the question. Thank you. Um, it's, look, I think these things can be codified in guidelines and, and um, experience can be built up um, through training. I think DFAT does this, does this work well. I actually think the Japanese service does this rather well too. Um, uh, there's also a sharing of information among like-minded like partners. Um, in my time running the service, it w we focused uh, our exchanges mostly with the Five Nations group. I used to call that group the Mutual Therapy Club because we'd come together from time to time and you'd say, God, you wouldn't know. You, you couldn't even believe what's just happened to me. And the other would say, oh, I know. You know <laughs> it, it, um, um, but, the, but I understand increasingly um, the Australian services are reaching out and um, well beyond that group and engaging with a, a full range of, of other services. Kate? <laughs> Kate, I'm going to get you to wait for a microphone. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, for the last few years, we've had annual consular <coughs> discussions with Japan, formal talks, which has been incredibly useful uh, on a range of issues. Um, but one point I was going to make in response to your question, it's a great question, and it's one that we have been thinking a lot about because um, we're not... We're not consular officers uh, from, from way back. We've also come to it late uh, and had foreign policy careers like Eva. <coughs> but when you start accumulating experience and knowledge about the consular work, it is, it is first of all, I think, a little bit addictive because you have that direct line to, to actually helping people and, 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 as Ian said, at the worst point of their lives sometimes. Um, but one of the things we've just brought in is, a, is a, a commitment from our human resources area to give us 25% of every graduate intake. Uh, we get to, to keep 25% of them uh, and train them up in consular issues, work with them. They're economists, they're lawyers, they're whatever they are, uh, but they come to us for a period and we have an internal rotation mechanism within the division where they get to work on consular cases, crisis management, they work in the crisis centre when something goes wrong overseas. So they, at the very beginning of their career, and Natasha um, probably wishes she had this, she might not have left, um, uh, but they become, uh, uh, you know, instinctive consular officers uh, for the rest of their career. That's our objective anyway, but it's, it's a yeah. good question and it's something we, we think a lot about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it seems like everybody's ready to have drinks and buy a book. I'm going to ask one last question of Ian, which is that you mentioned there's a special place in hell for people who write their memoirs. <laughs> um, this book is something of a rarity, though. You think about in Australian life, you know, politicians often write their memoirs, but one of the reasons I was so fascinated by this is senior bureaucrats often do not. So. Mm -hmm. And I always assumed it was something about the risk appetite of our public service. But here you are, you've done it in great detail and it's such an excellent read. You know, how did you pull this off? And are you breaking the mould? Is this the start of a grand tradition for Australian public servants? I doubt that. I, um, <laughs> look, I, I, I was... Um, I had this ongoing conversation with UQP. Um, uh, I... I I met um, the former head of UQP when I was ambassador in Berlin and then I was introduced to the publisher, Madonna Duffy, and she'd say to me from time to time, I think you've got a book in there, Ian. Um, and I sort of thought about it and I thought, well, yeah, but let's... I don't want to write about myself, I want to write about the consular service. The, the process, particularly the early part of, the, of, of writing this book, had, had my publisher saying, hang on a second, make sure you tell your own story. Um, so I was pushed a bit into, into, into telling my own story because I had this aversion, as I say, to diplomatic memoirs. But I came to understand that it was useful to use my voice and use my experience to, to tell that story. Conscious Field is, 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 is one you can actually write about. You've got to be a little bit careful, but um, the guidelines of official secrecy um, are probably easier to negotiate uh, in the consular field. 
you have to be careful about the Privacy Act um, and not, not breach individuals' privacy. But it's a bit easier in this sense. I don't think I'm starting some big trend, Tash. <laughs> well, we're very grateful for you doing this today. Congratulations. Thank you for joining us at the Lowy Institute to launch it this evening. Thanks to the Assistant Minister and Michael as well. Um, after this discussion, I'm sure you're all eager to buy a book up the room as well as stick around for a drink <coughs> conversation. Um, it's been wonderful. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you.